Okay, let's go to our study. And I think we all remember what it's about, amen? We're studying about the Bible. And uh, last uh, couple of weeks, be, be, we've studied on the canonization of the Bible. Uh, we believe it was completed, amen? From front to back, there should nothing be added. There should nothing be taken away. We believe that the Word of God is inspired, amen? It's the inspired Word of God. It's truth from front to back. We believe that with all our heart. And we've said if we have the King James Version Bible in our hands, we believe you have the Word of God in your hands, the complete Word of God. It's the preserved Word of, inspired and preserved Word of God in the English language. So, and that is a blessing that we can have that. So let's go to the book of, uh, I think it's 1 Timothy where we're going to go this evening. 1 Timothy. And I forget, I don't have that much time on Wednesday, so I get to, need to get into my study. First Timothy, chapter 6, is where we're going to go this evening. And like I said, we've looked at the canonization of the Bible, but today I want to go a little different and, uh, you know, look at the New Testament, and this is how I actually... Titled, the New Testament was carefully preserved. So, so was the old, but so the New Testament was carefully preserved as well. And, uh, but not just preserved, it was also transmitted to the next generations. And that is why we have the Bible today. Amen? It was preserved. First, it was inspired. It was canonized. But it was preserved and transmitted to the next generations. And God wants people today to keep on doing that. He's used people in every generation to preserve it and to transmit it to the next generation. Amen? And he still wants to use people to do that. I'm so thankful there's still people that love the Word of God. I'm so thankful there's still people that are jealous of the Word of God, that still want the true Word of God and that look into which is the true Word of God, that will not just accept any book that says Holy Bible, because everything that says Holy Bible today, we don't know if the complete Word of God is in there. Amen? Because there's so much changed as we've seen in the past. So much of it has changed. But I'm so thankful we still have the preserved Word of God, and it, and it is transmitted to the next generation still. So... Here, I want to look at some things today, you know. The believers in the early churches were taught to preserve the scripture without spot. Without spot. And I think we need to be taught to do the same thing. We should always look into what kind of Bible we have. Is this really the preserved scripture without spot? Or isn't it? Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 6. And I'm going to read from verse 12 to 14. It says, Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. Here Paul is talking to Timothy. And verse 13 says, I give thee charge in the sight of God, who quickeneth all things, and before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession, that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. So here we see Paul was actually very strict. You need to preach the gospel as it is, was given to you. You need to preserve scripture without spot. You don't add, you don't take away. Preach what you've been taught. And you know, it's so important. But they, they were further taught to carefully transmit, not just to preserve the scriptures without spot, but they were further taught to carefully transmit it to 
succeeding generations. Now, I believe Christ is going to come back pretty soon. Amen? I believe this with all my heart. You know, it could happen today. As we're sitting here in a church, wouldn't that be something? Poop! We're gone. Amen? That would be a blessing. I am looking forward to that day. But it could still take 100 years. We don't know. Because the Bible doesn't actually tell us exactly when this is going to happen. So we need, as Christians, to ask God for wisdom so we can carefully transmit Scripture to the succeeding generations. Amen? Teach the younger people. You know, today, how many churches still use the King James Version in this area? Not many. Not many. I know some Baptist churches that do, and I probably think there's probably some others. I don't know. But because they say the newer, the newer Bibles, they're so much easier to understand. And somehow I don't understand them as, easy, as, as good as I understand the, the King James Version. This is still the book I understand the best. Jesus commanded, you know, like I said, they were further taught to carefully transmit it to succeeding generation. Jesus commanded this in Matthew 28, 19. Let's go there. I think all of us know what Jesus said there in Matthew 28. And I'll read from verse 18 there. Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Uh, all of you, us that are at home here, already know that I do a lot of rabbit jumping in the Bible. Amen? Go from one place to another. So It says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. So what is Jesus saying here? We are to teach everyone and observe everyone, teach them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. We are supposed to teach people to observe all things, whatever Jesus has commanded. What does that mean? I shouldn't be up here preaching what I think is right, right? I should be up here preaching what Jesus says. But as same as I am, I should be up here preaching what the Word of God teaches, all of you should be out there Speak in that same language. Are we here this evening? Telling people what Jesus teaches. What Jesus says. Tell them Jesus, yes, he loves. And you know, this is the thing. Jesus loves all people. He loves sinners. That's why he came to this earth. But he hates sin. And so when we say Jesus is love, we also need to teach that Jesus is a just Savior. Amen? They have to know that there is a judgment, and I think I touched this before, before they can understand that they need to be saved. So we need to teach them what Jesus commands us to teach them. You know, Jesus is instructing the churches to teach all things whatsoever he has commanded here. This would require that the believers need to possess all things in writing, and writing that we can have confidence in. So to be able to teach what Jesus te taught, we need to have the preserved word of God, don't we? If we don't have the preserved word of God, then we really can't teach them exactly what Jesus taught. So that's so important. 
that we understand that, that we need to have the preserved Word of God, the inspired, canonized, preserved Word of God. When I say inspired, it's every letter is inspired of God, we believe. It is canonized, it is finished, it is complete. It is above reproach, and it is preserved. So this is important as believers as we go out there. We need to believe this with all our hearts. You know, and, and they did at the beginning. The Gospels, the Acts, the Epistles, they had all of this, and they used it to bring out the gospel at that time. Second to Timothy, and I'll go there as well. In Second Timothy, the preachers were instructed to pass along exactly the same things they had been taught by the apostles, and let's see to who they were instructed to give this to. Second Timothy 2.2. 2. I'll read verse 1 and 2 says, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to the faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. So here Paul is telling Timothy to instruct he instructed Timothy to pass along exactly the same things they had been taught by the apostles to faithful men who would be able to teach others. So what is the church to do? The church is always to teach others so they can serve as well, right? Or is it like in so many churches they believe, no, the pastor's job is to go out there and teach others. Brother Abe knows what I'm talking about. He was a pastor for a lot of years. You know, it's not just the pastor's job. And I, 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 I think I've said it here before. I, I must have because I've been here now for almost eight months. Amen? You know, the pastor's job is to feed the flock. And whatever the flock receives they ought to bring out there to others. Amen? That's how it works. They ought to. And that's what the Bible teaches. But the pastor at the same time needs to be out there too. I agree with that 100%. Some pastors don't, but I like to be out there also visiting. And to who are we to teach this? To faithful men who would be able to teach others. To faithful, faithful brothers and sisters that can touch, teach other sisters. There's a lot of churches that don't believe this is exactly what we ought to do, but there's nothing haphazard or careless about this process. And I like the way uh, one of the Commentator says it, the only ones who would be haphazard or careless in this regard would be the false teachers and nominal Christians. False teachers don't think that you need to teach others to go out there and preach. You know, uh, I received a video yesterday and Brother Abe has it as well. And uh, of a church that's here in this town and what they preach. And the head man of theirs, the, the person actually that uh, leads that church, his name is uh, Ray Thinsdale. He's from Ohio. But the one that leads it here is Henry Hillebrand. Okay? And they really actually starting to believe things that are scary because they are misleading people so much. 
And so we need to pray for people like that as well. They need salvation. Because Ray Tinsdale actually believes he's more important than the apostles. He is an apostle, but he is a higher apostle. He, he is more important. And if he says they can be saved, they can. And if not, they can't. So there is a lot of false churches out there, false preachers. And they don't instruct exactly what the Bible teaches. And that's the sad part. We are to look at what the Bible says and teach others so they can pass it on, but also teach about the inspired, canonized, preserved Word of God. That people, people can know that we can still have the Word of God in our hands, and we can still teach it. The New Testament was multiplied and went into all the world. We see in Acts 1, 8, 12, 24, 19, 20, Romans 10, 18, uh, Colossians 1, 6. I could go to all of these, but at the same time, I know we probably don't have all that time. But let's go to Acts 1, 8 there. I'm going to read some of these. Here in Acts 1, 8, it's actually the commission to evangelize the world. And here Jesus is speaking. In Acts 1.8, and he says, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. So, I know we as believers lots of times say, while for others it is easy to serve, but for me it isn't. You know, if I would depend upon self, I wouldn't be preaching the gospel. I just wouldn't be up here. Because I could never do it. And I acknowledge that. I would never be able to preach one single message on a Sunday or teach the Bible here on a Wednesday if I had to do it by my own power. But I'm so thankful for this verse. But ye shall receive power. Amen? After that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Now my question today is, is the Holy Ghost upon us? He is in us. If we are saved, the Holy Ghost is in us. Amen? So what does that tell us? Now, is the Holy Ghost weaker than God the Father? No, he's the same. We believe in one God, three persons, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. He's just as powerful. So. If this verse is true, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon us, this means that we can be witnesses upon, unto all, can't we? We can be witnesses to all people. And that's exactly what the believers here in Acts did. The Holy Ghost told them, uh, I mean, uh, Jesus tells them here, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witness unto me both in Jerusalem, or Jerusalem as Elmer, and in old Judea and Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And they did. They went out there to preach the gospel. They actually believed that this power was given to them to do this. They had faith in what the what, word of God was saying. How much faith do we have today? Do we believe that the Holy Ghost can still use us if we are saved? I believe with all my heart that he can because you're looking at living proof. And I'm looking at living proof because I know how the Holy Ghost uses so many of you. 
That is a blessing. But this is what we need to teach others that the Holy Ghost can and wants to use them. He does not want to be idle in, or, in us, in our hearts. He, does, he wants to work. He wants to be active. He wants others to know about Jesus Christ and salvation through the shed blood of the only begotten Son of God. So yes, he wants people to know that the Word of God is still the Word of God. The New Testament was multiplied and went into all the world. Into all the world. Let's go here to Acts chapter 12. Same book, different chapter. Chapter 12. Verse 24 says, But the word of God grew and multiplied. As all of these that were saved there in Acts were obedient to God's will and went out there to preach the gospel, the word of God grew and was multiplied. Amen? Amen. The word of God grew and was multiplied. That can still happen today. We have the word of God. I used to say to people in Mexico, as, I, as we started the missions there in Mexico, it was a little different because we would get people in that weren't saved and we'd have to teach them first how to be saved. And some of them, even that God is actually a real God because some of the people would have never gone to church you know, I would always say, when you read your Bible, when you go home and read your Bible, and it's so important that you do that, but I would always say, don't just treat it as any book. Just imagine, I said, when you open the, the Bible and you start reading, just imagine as if it is God standing before you and talking to you face to face. And that's how I believe it should be, because this is God's inspired word. If we treat it that way, everything changes. If we say this is actually God speaking to me face to face because he inspired every letter of it and preserved it, that changes how we live, how we think of it. And I always used to say, do that, and then you will understand a little bit better what God is saying. Because if God should stand before us, I think we'd be very, very, paying attention very, very strictly. Amen? I don't think our mind would be wandering all over the place like it does lots of times now as we read. I used to ask people at church, are you here? I see you're here, but I don't know where your mind is. Amen? Our body is here, those of us that are here, but lots of times our mind wanders so much. And so, yes, it multiplied greatly. Uh, you know, and I could go to different verses here as well, but I'm going to finish because it is Wednesday. And, you know, this, this divine multiplication, it was... It grew and was multiplied, and this divine multiplication worked to safeguard the text of Scripture from the efforts of heretics to corrupt it. All through the centuries, there has been people that want to corrupt God's Word. And there are still people today that want to corrupt God's Word. There's a lot of people out there that want to corrupt God's Word. We need to understand we have an enemy and now I'm not talking about the flesh, because yes, the flesh is our greatest enemy. The flesh wants to live for this world. But we have an enemy that hates God with a passion. His name is Satan, the devil, whatever else you want to call him. He hates God. He hates God's word. And I want to tell, tell you, he hates you and he hates me if we are Christians. 
And he will do everything in his power, first of all, to make us doubt that we can still have the preserved word of God in our hands. He doesn't want us to believe that. Second, he's going to try to destroy God's preserved word with everything in his might. There is people today printing Bibles left and right, different versions. There are so many versions, I don't even know how many there is anymore. And they're just writing for money. The older versions are difficult to get anymore. So yes, I'm so thankful there are still people that love the Word of God. Now, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, that's what I'm going to read here. I took from a, a book. It's called Which Version, Authorized or Revised? And that's actually by Philip uh, Mar Morrow. It's written by Philip Morrow. Which Version, Authorized or Revised? And I want to read it. It says, The fact that the gospel was preached to all nations and tongues reminds us that the New Testament was translated into other languages at a very early date. And so it does. It was translated into other languages at a very early date. So there was people of God really worried that people should hear the gospel in their own language. And did you know there's still lots of languages that don't even have the New Testament in their language yet? There's still a lot out there in the world that don't have the Word of God in their own language. So that we need to pray for that as well so people could get that and that God would preserve some men that are jealous for His Word to be able to translate it the right way. Amen? Not just translate it so they can have something that isn't, that will change doctrine. Because a lot of those new versions, they really change doctrine. They really change doctrine. And that is worrisome. Yeah, but it goes on to say here, and I, let's see if I say, say this word correctly, and I even asked my son, how do you pronounce it correctly? Syriac? the Syriac and Old Latin date to the second century. So even in the second century, they had this, the Syriac and, and Old Latin scripture. To this, and that is a blessing. It says, ancient translations are early and important witnesses to original Bible texts. This translation of the written word into various tongues is but a carrying out of that which the miracle of Pentecost indicated as a distinctive characteristic of this age, namely that everyone should hear the saving truth of God and the tongue wherein he was born. How many of us know how many tongues there is in this world? I have no idea. And I think now I'm, I have some homework to do because I, I would like to know that. But there's a lot of languages. How many of us know, and because it's Bible study, I like to ask questions, why there's so many languages? Do we know that? Amen. That we know. Amen. Because mankind was trying to build Tower of Babel. Amen. A tower that would go all the way to heaven. But yes, if everyone could have the Word of God in their own language, that would, in the tongue wherein he was born, that would be a blessing. And I, I believe if they could have John 3.16 in their own language, that would go a long way. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Amen? That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but should have everlasting life. And he goes on to say here, Thus the agreement of two or more of the earliest versions would go a long way toward the establishment of the true reading of any disputed passage. It is appropriate at this point to direct attention to the very great value of a version as a witness to the purity of the original text from which it was translated. So I believe this is so important. 
The receptus tax, I believe, is the one we, that is the preserved word of God. Westcott and Hort, that's the one they use today to translate almost any other Bible. King James Version, receptus tax. In Spanish, I've said it before, 1602, receptus tax. Now, the 1960 is, a, is pretty good, but it has some verses from Westcott and Hort. That's something we should always look at when we buy a Bible. From what text was it translated? It is very important. And I think uh, uh, the older, like it says here, the better. If it's old, then it, I think we can have more confidence in it. I believe that. And uh, Okay, now where was I here? Those who undertake a work of such importance as the translation of the New Testament into a foreign language would, of course, make sure, as the very first step, that they had the best obtainable Greek text. And that they need to make sure. Therefore, a version as the Syriac or Old Latin of the second century is a clear witness as to the text recognized as that early day as the true text. So this would be a true text. And this is taken from uh, which version authorized or revised Philip Morrow. So and he writes a lot about Bible history. And, and so it is important that we understand the old version, the receptus text is so important that we keep that. You know, uh, on Bible we can learn so many things. And I thought when I was going to start teaching on, on the Bible and, and, and doctrine, I'd probably be there two Wednesdays. And now how long have I been there? Three or four? And there's still so much more that I've seen, I'd like to look at. So we will be here a couple of more Wednesdays at least. You know, through this process, the New Testament epistles in Greek were distributed throughout the world, even in the first century, throughout the Middle East, to Africa, Asia, Minor, Europe, probably as far as England and the West and India and the East. And this is also from the same book. So through this process, the New Testament epistles in, in Greek were distributed throughout the world, even in the early centuries. And if they believed that it was the preserved word of God in the early centuries, we can definitely believe it's the word, preserved word of God today. Amen? I am so thankful that when I got to know Christ, it was in a church that loved the Lord, in a church that loved the Bible, in a church that believed in a preserved word of God, in a church that thought you need to pay attention to doctrine. You need to see what is being taught. And not just listen to your pastor and go home, oh, this is what the pastor says. What if the pastor is wrong? Okay? Because the pastor is a man. He can be wrong. So it's important that everyone checks at home is what is being taught, does it actually, God actually teach this? It is important that you do that because every pastor can be wrong at one point. And so it's so important that we ourselves study the Bibles. We want what God teaches, not what man teaches. And when a pastor do, is wrong, he should recognize it if once he recognizes it, he should repent and acknowledge it. Are we here? And those stones are actually thrown right back at me because I'm your pastor right now. But I believe that with all my heart. God's word needs to be thought God's way. And we should be a jealous people for God's word. And have part in the work of preserving God's word, because it is complete. Amen? And have a part in preserving it, teaching others that they need to do the same thing. That is so important. 